now I'd like to introduce Dr. Karan Maskey. She is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School and child neurologist and sleep medicine specialist at Boston Children's Hospital. Her clinical work and research is focused on central nervous system disorders of hypersomnolence. She served as the co-chairperson of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Task Force for the Treatment of Central Nervous System Hypersomnias, the Task Force member for the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, sorry, Sleep Disorders Version 3, and chairperson for protocol development for MSLT and MWT in children. Dr. Maskey is a member of the Medical Advisory Boards for Wake Up Narcolepsy, Klein-Levin Syndrome Foundation, and the Hypersomnia Foundation. Her research on sleep diagnostic and prognostic biomarkers has received grant support from the National Institutes of Health, the American Academy of Neurology, the American Sleep Medicine Foundation, Wake Up Narcolepsy, Boston Children's Hospital Research Council Fund, and Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Maskey is the 2024 recipient of the Research Pioneers Award from Wake Up Narcolepsy for her research in pediatrics. Welcome, Dr. Maskey. Thank you all. Thank you for your attention. I know it's a long day and uh, it's really hard to follow Anne-Marie, I got to tell you, in terms of uh, her ability. To, she's just a wonderful speaker. So if anyone needs to get up and stretch, I will not be offended. <laughs> if you need to get up and get something to drink, no problem. Um, so I do have some uh, conflicts of interest just to disclose here, but I hope to present a balanced, informed uh, discussion about the treatments for idiopathic hypersomnia. So when we start with thinking about the medication landscape for treatment of sleepiness, essentially, we're thinking of wake-promoting medications and what medications do. So essentially, wake-promoting medications are activating neurotransmitters or neuropeptides, including acetylcholine, dopamine, histamine, norepinephrine, orexin, or serotonin. And these are what essentially the medications I'll be going through are trying to target. Essentially, these are neuronal populations in the brain that project to the broader areas of the brain, the cortex, to maintain wakefulness. Conversely, when we want to sleep, it's predominantly regulated by a neurotransmitter called GABA. Um, and essentially what GABA does is inhibit all of those wake promoting neurotransmitters so that sleep can be a continuous refreshed process. So now applying this to idiopathic hypersomnia is sometimes difficult as you sort of heard from um, Dr. Trotty's talk, idiopathic hypersomnia really encompasses a broad range of symptoms. And for one, there's a subtype of patients that present with very severe daytime sleepiness where the, something like the Epworth might be very useful. But the majority of patients seem to present with long sleep duration or sleep inertia, difficulty with waking up. And so as a result, there's this sort of um, dichotomization and expert opinion about what idiopathic hypersomnia looks like based on our clinical experience yet it's lumped all together as a single entity, idiopathic hypersomnia. And so that's where there's some confusion about narcolepsy type two versus idiopathic hypersomnia, because some of those patients do in fact look like narcolepsy type two. And more recently, there was some billing data that at least 69% of, of patients with a label of idiopathic hypersomnia also had long sleep duration, suggesting that that might be the more common uh, type. So in recognition as what uh, Dr. Trotty and uh, Dr. Morse were talking about, um, we had this uh, treatment parameters that was put together by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And essentially what we do is we get together with experts in the field and we evaluate the quality of the evidence from clinical trial data. And I thought one important thing that um, was done in, in our endeavors is we really were very careful not to just evaluate things like the Epworth sleepiness score. And we wanted to make sure that um, both when we were evaluating as well as sending messages to future drug developers, that there's more to consider than just sleepiness. So these are the outcome measures that we were looking at for idiopathic hypersomnia. The check marks represent those that we thought were important, but we also included um, patient advocacy groups like the Hypersomnia Foundation in providing us input in deciding what we should be measuring. 
So things like cognitive performance, excessive daytime sleepiness, fatigue, um, quality of life, overall disease severity, sleep inertia, and work performance ended up being very important and things that we were looking for the evidence um, to, to guide us in terms of approval or making recommendations for use in these medications. Um, and as I'll go through um, some of the, the scales that we use, just so you're familiar with what I'm um, discussing. So when we talk about overall disease severity, we use surveys like the idiopathic hypersomnia severity scale or a, a global impression scale. What do you think about your disease overall? What do you think about, um, what does your uh, provider think about the condition in terms of improvement? Um, and then there's the upward sleepiness score. Um, there's also objective tests of wakefulness. So that's called the maintenance of wakeful test, which is essentially, it sounds torturous, but 40 minute tests where four times in a day, um, assessing the ability to stay awake on current medication. Um, conversely, there's the uh, mean sleep latency test, which some of you in this room may have had. How quickly do you fall asleep when you're given a nap opportunity across a day? Um, there's fatigue severity scales, there's quality of life scales, there's even now sleep inertia scales, and there's work performance outcomes. So all of these are measures that you will see in the subsequent slides. So starting off with sort of just treatment discussions, um, I try to organize and synthesize this as, as succinctly as I could, um, but each of these tables lists the drug, the typical dose, the mechanism of action, which kind of neurotransmitter that we use, the efficacy, which I'll go through, of course, but I just want to caution you that this is based on very small clinical trials oftentimes, um, and, but it's just really a use of guidance, and then the side effects that sometimes happen. So traditional stimulants are either methylphenidate or um, amphetamine-based medications, and these primarily work through the dopamine system. So they essentially are activating dopamine receptors and sometimes preventing their reuptake. And again, that's a very uh, prominent wake-promoting uh, neurotransmitter. Based on observational studies, Epworth um, in Dr. Trotty, who's uh, just presenting some of this data at this conference, um, comparing modafinil versus methylphenidate, found that there was about a 4.4 point improvement on the Epworth uh, sleepiness scale. We think that three is usually about what we like to see for patients. Um, that suggests that it is effective. In other studies, um, anywhere from 40% of patients reported that they had a complete response and 21% had a partial response. Side effects of the medications include palpitations, difficulty with falling asleep, decreased appetite, nausea, vomiting, headache, mouth um, dryness, and sweating. Um, Pitolisant um, is a histamine-based medication, and it actually just completed a clinical trial and is under pending review for approval. Um, I list it here because I do know some people use it off-label for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, at least based on the clinical trial um, early reports, um, there was a 9.4 improvement on the upward sleepiness scale based on from their baseline. But again, this is unpublished data um, from the randomized control uh, study that was produced. So we're really looking for more evidence there. In general, GI pain, increased appetite, even weight gain, headache, and insomnia are potential side effects of that medication. Modafinil, so uh, many people are on modafinil for treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia, and that's primarily because there has been some evidence of use uh, and, and efficacy in clinical trials. So this is a medication that we think works through the dopamine system. And at least based on clinical trials, there was a four to five point improvement on an upward sleepiness score and about a five minute improvement on the maintenance of wakeful tests. So both subjective and objective improvement in daytime sleepiness. Um, side effects of this medication are very similar to the um, traditional stimulants, but lesser in frequency. Here, important things to note are that it is associated with very rare cases of what's called Steven Johnson syndrome, a very rare but very dangerous type of skin reaction. Um, and it can lower the efficacy of oral contraceptives, as can the um, pitolisant that I mentioned. So that might not be the right medication for many women. Um, Dr. Trotty um, also had studied clarithromycin, um, which is actually an antibiotic. And the reason that some people use this antibiotic for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia is because 
Um, one of the proposed mechanisms of idiopathic hypersomnia is that it's essentially a condition of overactive GABA receptors. So GABA being that neurotransmitter that promotes sleep. So maybe those receptors are more enhanced or, or more sensitive. And so clarithromycin, even though it's an antibiotic, actually can um, modulate that sensitivity. So in a clinical trial, when it was used, it produced a benefit of about 3.3 points. Again, three being you know, what clinically we like to see as an improvement, um, but there was really a large variability in those findings. Um, Dr. Trotty also included other measures like quality of life and used psychovigilance testing, um, basically to measure a cognitive benefit and found some improvements in that as well. Um, the side effects of the medication include GI upset, as many of you have probably taken antibiotics can <laughs> relate to. Um, it actually also altered taste. It, it has like a very metallic taste that people found very unpalatable and nausea, uh, insomnia and diarrhea. Um, it does have a black box warning about its potential to prolong the QT interval. And there is some concern that taking antibiotics in a chronic fashion could um, in increase um, antibiotic resistance. And the same sort of thinking, flumazenil, um, what is also been studied. Uh, flumazenil, like the clarithromycin, is basically acting on that GABA um, neurotransmitter system. It's actually used for the treatment of overdose when people overdose on benzodiazepine medications or GABA medications. Um, this is a medication that's typically either sublingual or compounded into a cream. And at least based on one clinical trial, 64% of patients reported some benefit, but it was a very small study. Um, dizziness, worsening sleepiness, headache, anxiety, and other mood disturbances were reported. So based on all of that evidence, and some of it we had and some of it we didn't, um, we were able to come up with a list of medications that we had recommended for use for treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. So I mention this because sometimes when people are struggling with insurance approval, this is something that you can reference um, to say that there is or is support from at least the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So those medications that received strong approval based on the quality of evidence that we had was modafinil and conditional approval, meaning it might work for some people, but not for everybody, um, was recommended for medications of clarithromycin, methylphenidate, pitolisant, and sodium oxabate. So I didn't mention sodium oxabate because uh, it really is... Um, a novel compound and not in the wake promoting activity um, category. This is a medication, if anyone's familiar, um, the trade name is Zywave. It's a low salt version that's been studied for uh, narcolepsy predominantly, and it's a sleep promoting medication. So it works through the GABA system. So it seems sort of crazy in some way to why would we use this type of medication for people who are already sleepy? Um, but because it's been studied in narcolepsy and there was some observational data that it helped with idiopathic hypersomnia, it prompted the first randomized uh, control trial in, um, in, uh, with this oxabate in idiopathic hypersomnia. And it received, it's the only FDA approved medication now for idiopathic hypersomnia. So I'll go through the, the trial in detail, um, but essentially uh, patients who tried it or were uh, on idiopathic hypersomnia um, reported a nine point improvement in their daytime sleepiness. So just to go through the study a little bit deeper, just because it's one of the few that are uh, FDA approved or the only one, um, this is a study called a placebo controlled double blind randomized withdrawal study. Um, I'll go through the protocol in a second, but this was for patients who are 18 to 75 years. Um, there were 56 patients with idiopathic hypersomnia and 59 patients with placebo. And they either received the, the lower salt oxabate dosing in either twice nightly dosing, meaning taking it at bedtime and then again in the middle of the night, that's how we dose it for narcolepsy patients. Or because as we all know, it's really hard to wake up in the middle of the night for idiopathic hypersomnia patients. They also studied a single night dose. So just taking it once at bedtime at a higher level up to six grams. So the protocol for these types of clinical trials, and, and I just 
really am emphasizing this one in particular, just simply because clinical trial participation is so important for getting these drugs even studied and approved. It's a necessary step. So I'm, I, I do hope it's not too boring, but just want to provide some detail of what people might be um, encountering when they enroll. So in this type of study, um, they were allowed to stay on their wake promoting medication, but anything that was sedating, they had to come off. So that was part of the screening period. Um, and then there's an open label period where basically patients are, or, or participants are put on a, the study drug and then it's titrated to an effect. And then they stay on that dosing that's called the stable dose period for two weeks. Then there's this withdrawal phase. And this is a unique kind of uh, clinical trial design where patients are either randomized to continue on the study drug um, or they're randomized to placebo sugar pulp. And so what we're really looking at is how much things change from the time they were on drug to off drug um, uh, and within the two groups of people who stayed on the treatment or people who were on placebo. And then there's an open label phase where everybody gets to continue on the medication and they're really looking for long-term uh, safety issues and benefit. Um, so based on that type of study design, um, essentially, let's see here, I don't know if I can point it out here. Um, when, the, when the drug um, was in the randomized controlled phase, so the end of the um, randomized to either placebo or to the study drug, the people who were randomized to placebo had an increase in sleepiness, and those that stayed on study drug had pretty much a stable um, uh, improvement in their sleepiness. And so the difference between the two groups was about 6.5 points on the upward sleepiness score. Um, interestingly, there was no difference in terms of the people who took the medication once nightly versus those who took it twice nightly. And um, to Anne Marie's point, Dr. Morris's point from before, um, a number of other measures were studied, including the idiopathic hypersomnia severity score, just a general impression score. What do you feel about your disease? And does, do you feel like it actually got better? Um, there was objective measures of the visual uh, on the visual analog scale of sleep inertia, and then um, uh, time missed on work or, or work performance, and all had significant improvement with this drug. But just like in The Little Mermaid, nothing comes for free. Um, unfortunately, there was a pretty high rate of, uh, of adverse side effects, so 80%. Uh, most of the side effects were mild, 22% uh, had nausea, about 20% headache, dizziness, um, anxiety, less appetite, um, which resulted in weight loss, which might not necessarily always be a bad thing, but um, was listed as a side effect. Um, about 17% of people actually discontinued the medication because of a side effect, however. Um, and so I think one follow-up from that that's been recently published and will be presented here at the sleep conference was that if you were to have a side effect, it tended to occur in the first five weeks. So it's something that hopefully could get better if, if with longer term use. Future therapies. Um, there was one study I mentioned that orexin is one of the neurotransmitter tra or neuropeptides important for wakefulness. And there's a lot of buzz about orexin because it's being studied for narcolepsy and really showing uh, promising efficacy. And so Danavorexin was a form of an orexin agonist uh, medication, and it was tried in this very small um, but randomized clinical control trial for idiopathic hypersomnia. So these were patients that were 18 to 75 years of age. There were 28 adults. They were on a protocol of either being on placebo and then going to the Danavorexin or Danavorexin and then to placebo. So everybody got some um, some exposure to treatment essentially. And it's probably too small to see, but I'll just um, uh, say it here. So um, on the maintenance of wakeful test, um, which is again, the objective measure of wakefulness, um, people had almost normal scores, um, which was nearly, um, you know, three, four times more than what the people on placebo had. That's very impressive. Um, the uh, Karolinska sleepiness score, you can think of it as a momentary sleepiness score was nearly half of those of what people on placebo had. And there was also significant improvements on a psychomotor vigilance test, sort of a cognitive test, uh, measuring sort of how fast um, is your reaction time. So very small study, 
promising though. And um, I think the significant side effects um, were pretty rare. Most side effects were in fact mild. Um, and uh, the more typical side effects were things like headaches, a really unique symptom called pol polycuria, which is essentially urinary frequency. And we're still trying to figure out why orexin might do that, but it might be that there are orexin receptors in areas that involve um, urinary urgency as well dizziness and rhinorrhea. So early days on that, but potentially promising. And I think you're gonna hear more about this um, study drug in, in later parts of this conference, but there was also a novel um, uh, stimulant um, called sir dexmethylphenidate that's currently in clinical trial. Um, they published just top line results. So this is basically like a stimulant, um, but essentially what it does, it's, it's a, it's, it's a pharmacologically um, manipulated such that it peaks later on. So essentially the medication is taken at bedtime and then the effects might not be there till the morning, which is where sleep inertia is usually the most problematic. So in this trial, people took it before bedtime or they took it before bedtime and again in the morning. And I believe some of the analysis will be presented here, but there was improvements in daytime sleepiness and improvements on the idiopathic hypersomnia scales so sort of a more global measure of um, disease severity, brain fog and sleep inertia. So we look forward to hearing certainly more about that. And side effects sounded very similar to what I had mentioned with the traditional stimulants um, and no one had discontinued because of side effects. So Anne-Marie covered this really well, I think in terms of non-pharmacologic management. Um, so I might just um, skip through this, but in particular for, for children and adolescents, um, things like um, test taking is really important. And so um, even for ACT or SAT type of tests, we write accommodations for timed um, extra breaks or uh, longer times to take uh, the test, extra time for projects, um, ability to keep cold water with them, fidget spinners, or even stand desks if necessary. Um, and I do want to mention Klein-Levin syndrome because I think it doesn't get a lot of attention, but if you're not familiar, Klein-Levin syndrome is a condition of periodic hypersomnia. So these are people who have um, episodic periods where their sleep duration goes for uh, almost 18, 20 hours at a time in bouts of uh, anywhere from two days to five weeks. And it can be really debilitating. I mean, it's almost like people are missing school because this oftentimes in adolescents and young people or work for long periods of time. Um, and so uh, we included this in the practice parameters in terms of our evaluation for treatment and outcome measures we were looking for is um, the number of bouts that they have per year or the duration of the bouts they have or the severity of the bouts um, and just general quality of life and work performance. So here there's even less information to really um, talk about and most of it's based on observational studies. But one drug that's been studied um, or included in a study was amantadine, which is a dopamine reuptake medication, but it also has some antiviral therapy. In um, one study, it improved um, or at least helped with mental clarity during an episode of Klein-Levin syndrome in 41% of patients, but then was lost effect over time. Um, modafinil, methylphenidate, amphetamines have all been studied as well. And I can say also my experience with this is similar. Um, while it might have helped them open their eyes, technically, they really were not there and felt like, you know, kind of a zombie. And so it really is not particularly useful. Klein-Levin episodes can also present with mood changes, including anxiety or paranoia. And in my experience, it can really worsen that. So really not recommended. Um, antidepressants, um, uh, at least in this study, did not have any effect on Klein-Levin symptoms. But if there's a depression component during this episode, um, medications like bupropion or fluoxetine were noted to be helpful. Antipsychotics, um, this has primarily been studied because in addition to the hypersomnia, some patients can have really um, profound behavioral changes um, such that there can be increased eating or even um, impulsive behaviors, hypersexuality. And so people have tried antipsychotics found it to be useful for delusional symptoms, but did not help with the overall Klein-Levin bouts. 
And then medications that are in the family of epilepsy medications, valproic acid or carbamazepine, were helpful in about 24% of cases. So you can see it's really people are quite desperate for treatments and we're really reaching deep, deep into our bag of what we have to see what can be potentially helpful. Um, and uh, not really coming up with anything thus far that's been particularly uh, systematically useful across patients. Um, most commonly, I wanna say, people have found lithium to be useful. So there's some thinking that because there's this cyclical nature of hypersomnia, it might live in the family of um, bipolar disease. And there's actually even overlapping uh, genes with bipolar that Dr. Mignot um, at Stanford have identified. Um, with lithium therapy, which is basically taken every day or twice a day, um, patients reported an, a significant improvement in one um, observational study that was done where they had about two and a half less episodes per year and overall said that there was about a 65.8% improvement in, in their Klein Levin um, disease category. But um, if you're not familiar, there's a lot of side effects with lithium, um, namely tremor, but also it can increase the frequency of urination, diarrhea, it can cause some subclinical hypothyroidism and you need to monitor with labs for toxicity. And then the more recent study um, that's been published in Klein Levin is using steroids. So basically IV steroids, um, when you have a bout of Klein Levin syndrome, this can be used in the first 10 days is uh, when it's thought to be most useful to reduce the duration of the Klein Levin episode. So if used like that, there was a significant improvement in patients who uh, were taking the, the episodic um, steroids versus uh, those before their, they did that, their baseline. Um, and it decreased it by about 12 days, which is very meaningful, but the confidence intervals were really wide. So certainly worth more study and, and seems somewhat promising, but I have to say clinically, it's very difficult to get someone who has so much hypersomnia to an infusion center to get the steroids over three days. So there's some feasibility barriers here. Side effects were insomnia, muscle pain, nervousness, um, and even, uh, but no people in encountered worsening psychosis or, or manic switching. So unfortunately, because we didn't really have robust um, data um, to evaluate, the only medication that we had to say that we recommended for Klein Levin was lithium. That's not to say anything else can't be tried. Um, just to say that, that's really just to say this is what the evidence shows that we have now. So non-pharmacologic management um, in, with Klein Levin, um, during these episodes, they are very sleepy and their judgment is impaired. So they shouldn't drive, they shouldn't go to school. Um, it's been sort of thought that maybe you should give them a stimulant, try to get them out of it, try to wake them from it, but it seems to prolong the episode. So we just let them sleep. Um, so we have to evaluate for tutoring services once they come out of it. Um, we have to provide safe environments during the times they are in hypersomnia episodes. Um, and we, you know, I think socialization sometimes can aggravate them. And so we really try to limit their environment during this time. And the Klein Levin Foundation is an amazing uh, place of support for patients. So in general, I think Anne-Marie had covered a lot of this but what can we do to support people with idiopathic hypersomnia as well as Klein Levin is I think first of all, listening and uh, the way our clinical practices unfortunately are not structured to allow for a lot of time to listen. But I think coming to conferences like this and, and hearing people's thoughts, um, our partnership with advocacy groups has really allowed for hearing people's feelings and concerns that we can take into our research or advocate for on your behalf. Um, recognize, uh, you know, clinically when avoidance behavior is there, as Anne-Marie had pointed out, mood disorders are very high in these conditions. And so we have to start watching for things like avoidance behavior or dropping out of social activities. Um, and to some degree, social supports can help and to some degree, medications can help. For instance, it might be that your medications are wearing off by the end of the day when you would be doing social activities. So you need a short acting medication to get you um, over that hump. Um, 
And then I think just, you know, uh, we have to be having open relationships, especially I, I work with a lot of adolescents. So we need to know what's going on in their lives about risk-taking behaviors or sexual behaviors and whatnot um, so that we can appropriately counsel on the right type of medication for them. So in conclusion, um, there are some therapies available for idiopathic hypersomnia that are recommended. And we typically use your symptoms, your comorbidities, insurance coverage, um, lifestyle, side effects, a lot of things that go into that basic discussion about what might be right for you. Um, and But we do need more mechanisms to provide support. I think this is a great uh, venue for that, but we really need that more. And I love what Anne-Marie is doing. I think having local chapters um, is really helpful. Um, and then there's a lot of unmet needs, unfortunately, in terms of the assessment scales. As you saw, um, there's a lot of assessment scales, but does this all address everything that people with idiopathic hypersomnia are going to, through? Um, I think that's an open question. And then unfortunately for Klein-Levin syndrome, there really needs to be a lot more research in this area. Um, the, the quality of evidence is quite small because these are rare conditions and um, oftentimes uh, it doesn't you need a lot of patients to really see benefits. Um, so I think more attention to that condition is certainly needed. Thanks for your attention. Oh, I can take questions. <laughs> Hi, um, you were talking about sleep aid medicines earlier. Um, some that I've tried are like gabapentin and trazodone. I also feel like uh, my like sleep drunkenness and those like uh, brain fog symptoms got worse when I was on those medicines. Do you see? Any like trend in that, or do you know if that's like actually a thing? Yeah, no, um, that's a great question. I think um, those are medications that are different than the gabinergic medication I mentioned, the oxabate. And um, oftentimes that's a side effect of trazodone and gabapentin because they do have a long half-life that people have worsening sleep inertia in the morning and more drowsiness when they try to wake up. Um, so that's interesting that you had tried that. I mean, I think that um, we don't really truly know why oxabate works um, in the way it does. It's not just that it helps with sleep because people sleep actually <laughs> well most of the time with idiopathic hypersomnia. And we don't know why it's so helpful in narcolepsy. I think that's sort of the uncomfortable truth. But uh, essentially, there's something unique about the oxabates that help with wakefulness and sleep inertia and reducing long sleep duration that differs from other sleep aids. Uh, this is a question about insurance denial. Uh, and that's something that Dr. Morris called attention to. Um, and I noticed that what she po called it, pointed out was all the things that a patient can do, like keep really good records, make a diary, you know, ask lots of good questions. Um, but I'm wondering, what do you think should be done at uh, the professional, professional society level or at the policy level uh, to facilitate these kind of uh, people dealing with these kind of problems? There's, there's still this kind of legitimacy deficit for IH that insurance companies, other physicians, um, they don't recognize IH as being something that they see as legitimate. You and your colleagues have put together these recommendations from the AASM, the expert panel saying, this is what we recommend. That's great. Um, I'm wondering what else can be done to uh, reduce that legitimacy deficit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Well, so that's a good point. Just because the American Academy of Sleep Medicine offers these as recommendations doesn't mean your insurance provider will respect that. So, um, I mean, it's a complex question. I mean, first of all, when I think through why medications are denied for idiopathic hypersomnia patients, one of it's not that they're not legitimizing the disease. They recognize that there is this entity their focus, if I'm thinking of the checklist that I oftentimes have to fill out, is what objective tests did you do to prove that they had this condition? 
And um, as Dr. Trotty had spoke about before, a lot of that is dependent on this multiple sleep latency test, which is not the right test for idiopathic hypersomnia. So we got ourselves into a loop right there by not having a legitimate test, an objective test as they're sort of saying. And I think that's an area of research, but there's ways of, I think, really trying to address that, you know, um, so there's, so for instance, actigraphy as a wristwatch device, um, it's not easy to use because oftentimes what we're looking for is long sleep durations to be measured across a week's time. But people need to work, people need to go to sleep or to school, like they're not able to sleep that long sleep duration to kind of capture that full duration of time. And so that sets them up for waiting um, until like a summer period or, you know, school break period or something like that, where that's even feasible. Um, and then not every center has actigraphy. It's not covered by insurance. And so essentially no centers have it. So I would say if, if I could have the ASM advocate for something, it would be for insurance coverage for actigraphy. I'm pretty sure that would prompt more approval of, of its use in, in various centers. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other devices out there, you know, and whether they can be validated for measuring long sleep duration as well, and could, you know, better um, approval of those lead to acceptance of the condition. So I, you know, I think oftentimes the conversations in sh with insurance stop when you don't, you're not able to produce adequate evidence of a disease state or condition state. Thank you, Dr. Muskie. It's incredibly informative.